Good morning. So, first of all, a big, big thanks to Al and to Glenn for giving me the opportunity to work with them on this project, which I must say is probably the most energizing project I've been involved in in years. Uh, and as Al was describing, I do come at this from another discipline. I'm very clearly coming at this from the outside, and I, I do hope to use that position to challenge you a bit. Uh, but first, I'd like to share just a couple of quick reflections based on things I saw in the last two weeks as part of our Master's in Healthcare Delivery Science program uh, that is running uh, right now. Um, first story uh, comes from a case study discussion. This was a case study about an effort at one of the, this country's leading medical institutions, one of the brand names that everybody would recognize right away, to create a cancer care center that was multidisciplinary and coordinated across all uh, the different specialists. And as part of this case discussion, we watched a very short video of the CEO of this institution, the leader of this institution, uh, talking about, in glowing terms, how proud they were of this multidisciplinary cancer center. And the CEO talked in particular about the practice of having a tumor board and discussing across all the disciplines what the best course of treatment was for specific patients. And he said, we have a good debate, we have a vigorous discussion, we try to forge an agreement, and when we can forge an agreement, we deliver that uh, decision to the patient. And when we can't decide, we let the patient decide. Right, and he said this as though he was so enlightened and being so magnanimous, and I, was, I felt like I'd been punched in the gut after getting to know what your efforts are all about uh, just a little bit, I th and I thought, okay, this is where we are today. Okay? This is the type of thing that you can hear from a leader from one of the most respected institutions around. So we have a big problem to tackle. Um, the second story came just a few days later when we were listening to a presentation by a project team that was anal analyzing the needs of the community with, that their hospital served and trying to come up with a framework that would guide decisions to either invest or disinvest in certain services within the hospital. And the analysis was thorough and impressive. And I happened to be sitting next to, to Al as this presentation was delivered and I kind of looked at him and he looked at me and I, I sort of got the sense we were both thinking the same thing. But, but we couldn't really, I, I couldn't say, Al, Al asked the question very, very politely. What I was thinking was, doesn't anybody understand that all this analysis is garbage unless it includes some knowledge about what patients want? Uh, and none of that was in the analysis, right? So how can you understand the needs of the community if what patients want don't go into the analysis at all? It was all based on actual consumption of services, which may, as we know in this room, be completely disconnected from what patients prefer. So a second punch in the gut that to me just highlighted just how important the work that you're doing uh, and that we're doing is. I think we also have to recognize, as Al was describing though, that we've this community has been at this work for a long time, and we still have a long way to go. Uh, we still have a very long way to go. And I think when you're in that situation, it is wise from time to time to kick the tires, so to speak, uh, to really challenge some of the fundamental assumptions that have been guiding the effort. Uh, and that's what I hope to do over the next 15 minutes or so. Uh, what I'm gonna do is present five hypotheses, uh, all of which represent what could be a pretty significant changes in direction for the effort to improve medical decision making. Um, and let me be very explicit, I'm trying to be provocative. Okay? I'm trying to be provocative in a way that perhaps I can be precisely because I come at this from the outside, okay? uh, from a different discipline, okay? for no other reason. Um, and uh, let me also say that probably nothing that I'll say hasn't been said before. Okay. These are not new thoughts. I'm simply urging their reconsideration. Okay. Um, I'm gonna present all five. I think you'll react to them with a mix of, that's interesting, or that's really naive. Okay. Um, both reactions are welcome. And in fact, after I've presented the five, I'm gonna give you a chance to talk about them at your tables and see how you react. 
Um, I'd ask, though, that you listen to all five before you tune out, okay? Because I want you to see the full picture. I want you to see the full picture before you react. Okay, five hypotheses. Hypothesis number one is that we need to reframe the problem. Now, I need to ask for just a little bit of feedback here. Um, I know you all are very busy, and after a full day of being a part of the conference yesterday and probably a desire to eat dinner and catch up on your email and, and get some rest, you may not have had time to tackle the entire paper uh, that we left you to read. Be honest with me, though, if you would, how many of you read at least the first three pages? First three pages, so the stories of Linda and Susan in particular. Okay, since that's almost everybody, I'm not going to read those again. But the point of those stories is that there is a different way to frame the problem that we're talking about here. Um, perhaps the problem is not that doctors are arrogant, that doctors take too much decision making into their own hands, that patients are uninformed and unengaged. Okay, that is the problem, but perhaps it could be stated differently. Perhaps the problem is misdiagnosis. Okay? Perhaps it's even something we could call the silent misdiagnosis, which makes it perhaps a bit more intriguing. There's something hard to hear, hard to see out there that is harming patients. What can we do about that? Okay? The silent misdiagnosis is a preference misdiagnosis. And what we lay out in the paper uh, in the first three pages is that the consequences of a preference misdiagnosis are just as severe and just as crucial okay, as the consequences of a medical misdiagnosis. Either way, you could perform, for example, an unnecessary surgery. Okay. Um, by the way, how many MDs are in the room? Okay, 20%? Why aren't there a whole lot more? It seems to me that for better or for worse, it's the MDs that have most of the power in the health system. Okay? And if they're not in the room, I think that hurts us in trying to create change. Perhaps defining the problem is misdiagnosis as opposed to doctors taking too much decision making uh, doing too much decision making on their own is one that will grab their attention and in fact make it impossible for, uh, to ignore us. Okay? Perhaps framing the problem as the silent misdiagnosis will get the decision makers, more of them, more powerful ones in the room. Okay? So that's hypothesis number one. Hypothesis number two, okay, I'd say we need to rebrand the solution. Brand like problem, is important just for getting people engaged, getting people into the room. The silent misdiagnosis is, sounds like a problem that doctors might really care about. We also need to brand the solution in a way that gets everybody that we need to be involved, involved. And I'd like to propose as a hypothesis that the right brand just cannot be shared decision making. Okay? Uh, in fact, I think Shared decision making as a brand is an enormous handicap. Okay. Two reasons. It's got two fundamental problems. Problem number one is this brand has no appeal to doctors. Problem number two is this brand has little appeal to patients either. Okay. Let's start with doctors. Shared decision making. I think a good brand appeals to a person sort of in their most primal minds their fantasies about themselves. In doctors' fantasies about themselves, they don't want to share. They want to kick ass and save lives. That felt okay coming out. I wasn't sure that would feel okay coming out. Okay? <laughs> I think that felt okay coming out. Okay, they don't want to share. They want to kick ass and save lives. This does not appeal to them in that way. Shared decision making um, could be better. We could come up with a better brand. Okay? One that allows the doctor to view themselves as that hero that kick ass, kicks ass and saves lives. Okay? How could we do that? Well, we could frame this in a different way. We could say to doctors, you know what? Uh, if you want to be a great doctor, you have to do more than diagnose disease. Okay? You have to do more than diagnose disease. Diagnosing disease 
is only a starting point. In fact, if you are not also able to diagnose preferences, by gosh, you're a lousy doctor. Okay? Great doctors diagnose preferences too. Shared decision making may also not work too well for patients, and I think that's because it immediately confronts them with what is a very nerve wracking burden. I'm sick, life and limb is at stake, and you're putting the weight of the decision on me. Okay. Believe me, if I'm the patient, I want help from experts. And I know that's what you're all about, but this is my first impression. Okay, my first impression is you've just put the weight of the world on my shoulders. So I'd like to propose as a hypothesis that we need to rebrand the solution. What could it be? I don't know. Okay, preference diagnosis is the language you, we used in the paper. Maybe that's worth consideration. Um, more likely, this is something we need to think about very, very carefully, and we need a brand that has great appeal to both patients and doctors. Okay, so that's hypothesis number two. Hypothesis number three is that we need to reshape the doctor to patient relationship. Let me first say what we all no doubt agree on, and that, that is that the model as doctor as agent, doctor as decider, that's a model we don't want. Okay? But I'd like to propose, again, as a hypothesis, that perhaps we've gone too far in the other direction. We frame the problem as how do we shift power from doctors to patients? Okay? How do we empower patients? And while I agree with that in spirit, I wonder if we could def sort of go halfway and still achieve the goals we're looking for. Okay. Can we say that the doctor is the provider of an expert recommendation, sorry, okay. the provider of an expert recommendation, not the decider. Let me be very clear, this is very different from doctor as agent or doctor as decider doctor as provider of expert recommendation, and by gosh, let's hope it's a recommendation that's grounded in an accurate preference diagnosis. And therefore, the patient is the consumer of the expert recommendation. What if instead of urging patients to take charge and make decisions on their own, we urge them to become better discerners of good versus bad expert advice? First criteria, very first criteria, okay? It's bad expert advice if it's obvious that the doctor has thought not a lick about you as a person and your personal preferences. If they've not presented the options and given some real thought to what you value. How many of you uh, would go to a financial advisor that presented you with a recommendation without asking you a single question about your goals in life and what you plan to spend money on in the future? Okay. Nobody would take advice from that kind of financial advisor. I think we need to teach patients to act in an analogous way. Okay. Maybe we don't need to put the full burden of decision making on their shoulders, but instead make them better discerners of good advice versus bad advice. Okay, hypothesis number four is that we need to develop two types of tools. One we've been very, very focused on, and the other, I think, has gotten far too little attention. Okay? The first kind of tools are those that inform choices for patients. Those that inform patients about what their options are, what the likely outcomes are, and what the evidence is to support those conjectures. Okay? I totally agree, we need those types of tools. In fact, we develop these tools with the hopes that patients will become very well informed. So well informed, in fact, that they will go back to the doctor and say, I know what I want, I'm confident I understand what we know, and this is my decision, period. Okay. I'd like to suggest that perhaps no matter how good these tools get, that's only going to happen a minority of the time. And because of that, we need a second kind of tool. We need tools that inform doctors about what patients want. Okay? In aggregate or in general, not what the patient, there's, I can't imagine any way to develop a tool that would inform a doctor what a, pa a specific patient wanted in a specific situation. 
but I can imagine all kinds of tools that would tell doctors more about what patients want. Um, quick, quick story here about a presentation I had the pleasure of listening to over at DHMC by Shannon Brownlee some time ago. And the full scope of the presentation I don't need to, to go through. I just want to share how I reacted to one slide in particular. And it was a slide uh, that showed breathtaking differences breathtaking differences between what patients want on average and what doctors think patients want. Okay, some of the authors of the paper where that data came from are in the room. Okay. Uh, it showed, for example, that 71% of doctors think that patients with breast cancer rate keeping their breast as a very high top three priority, while only 7% of patients agree. 71 versus 7. And I remember seeing that data and my jaw just hitting the floor. But you know what was even more surprising than that? I looked around the room and I was the only one that flinched. Okay? And the reason I flinched is because I come from the business world. Okay? And in the business world, if you were to present an executive team with data that showed that they literally had no freaking clue what their customers wanted, Okay? You could expect a revolt. The last thing you would get is silence. Okay? If we agree that the first type of tool will not fully solve the problem on, the own, on its own, we're not going to get all patients to walk in, march into their doctor's offices and announce, this is my decision, okay? then we need doctors that are a lot better estimators or diagnosers of what patients want when patients don't do that, when they don't just walk in and make their decision clear. Okay. And such tools might be data sets that show what patients want on average. Okay. The fact that only 7% of breast cancer patients rate keeping their breast as a top three priority, okay. Should, isn't, isn't that as critical uh, medical knowledge as, as we said in the paper, the thigh bone is connected to the hip bone? Okay. Every doctor should know that kind of data like the back of their hands. There's no excuse for that kind of disparity. Okay, so we need a second type of tool. Final hypothesis. In developing tools, we need to make usage more important than accuracy. I understand that uh, historically, there's been uh, a lot of investment in tools that are extremely sophisticated and have the potential to lead patients to the point that they are confident that they can decide on their own but that those tools have not been widely adopted. Okay. If we accept that um, most of the time patients aren't going to march into the doctor's office and say, this is my decision, then we ought to be looking for any tool okay, that at least points us in the right direction and is actually used. Okay. A tool that is approximate but frequently used is better than a tool that is accurate but never used. And that's why uh, I've been so excited as I've learned more about option grids, for example. Okay? Not perfect, but usable. Very, very usable. We floated another proposal in the paper about developing a diagnostic of gen general patient preferences. Okay. Think of it as a Myers-Briggs of patient preferences that would assess whether, on average, a particular patient was inclined to medical intervention or disinclined towards medical intervention. And we got some pushback on that. Hey, that changes over time. It might change a lot when you receive a diagnosis. And that is certainly true. Question is, is it going to push you in the right direction more often than it pushes you in the wrong direction? And is it going to be used? Is it going to be used? Would its mere presence highlight uh, or elevate the amount of time that we spend thinking about preference diagnosis? Okay, so those are the five hypotheses.